letter to the Romans, chapter 6. And uh, our consideration this morning is verse 23. Let's read verse 15 to the end of the chapter. Romans 6, 15 to the end of the chapter, though our consideration is from verse 23. Uh, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin which leads to death, or of obedience which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you who are once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting? at that time from the things of which you are now ashamed. For the end of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Lord, we seek help, not just in understanding the verse before us, but we seek your spirit in the application of it in our lives. That we would, be, we would bear fruit out of the new understanding we hope to glean from this verse. That our lives will be transformed by the renewal of our minds and that we would be conformed to the likeness of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen. Uh, let me just give you a background to this verse. Paul, in this chapter, has made a very clear contrast between what believers used to be without Christ, they were slaves of sin, and what we are since Christ Jesus saved us. We are slaves of righteousness, leading to eternal life. We discovered that uh, every sinner, every sinner is held captive. To obey sin, that old evil master, he is a cruel one. So there is no unsaved person who is free from this master. They may be young, but they are young slaves of sin. They may be old but they are old slaves of sin. A baby is a slave of sin. An old man on his deathbed is a slave of sin if unsaved. But when Christ intervened by his grace, he bought and freed us from that tyrant and gave us new instructions, new service, being our new master. The new position given is a wonderful, glorious service of obeying the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, our Redeemer. He is our new master and we are delighted to be in his service, or are we? Are we delighted to be in his service? The verse before us gives us 
a summary of the verdict of those two services. The wages of sin is death. It cannot be anything less. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We know that one day Paul tells us in the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, he says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account of what you've done in the body, whether good or evil. It is not we may all appear. It is we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And the question is, what do you think would be the verdict for your life lived in the body? What would be the verdict? What will the Lord say? Is it death or is it life? Because there are no alternatives. You know, when you are sentenced, when you are charged in a Kenyan court, you present yourself, you don't know what the judge might say. Isn't it? He may say, Case dismissed, he may say, a fine, he may say, a sentence of so many years in prison. You don't know. You don't know how he's going to interpret the law. You don't know how he's going to interpret the penal code, do you? But in this case, we are told that there are only two verdicts. Only two judgments to be given. Death or life. Which means you can have a rough idea of what is going to be. Surely. We all know whether we are going to death or to life. Don't we? So sometimes you evangelize and, and you ask a person, do you think you will go to heaven? And they will say, ah. They don't know. They are playing it safe. They know. Have you had people tell you they don't know? They don't know whether they're going to have eternal life, they say. Do, do you believe it? The penal code of God has been set before everyone. The gospel we proclaim. It sets things in black and white. It's either left all right, there is no alternative. So you who is seated here today, maybe you are invited by your friend or by your relative and you are not expecting to be put in one box or another. That's the way the Bible sets it forth. You have always thought to yourself, ah, I will think about it. I will know what to do in due course. And you have never really wanted to be boxed to be either to the left or to the right, either to death or to life. You have, you have thought, eh, mi mi niko tu. Nusu nusu, sometimes people say. What is, your, what is your place? Is it death or is it life? Because those are the only, those are the only judgment. Those are the only two issues. That's a verdict. And it's final. Once it is death, it is death. You cannot do anything about it once you are dead. You cannot cross over. But right now, God in his mercy wants you to cross from death to life. That's why you're hearing this. God wants you to move from eternal death to eternal life. 
And don't try to dismiss it in your mind and say, I will think about it. The hammer, the ultimate judge of the universe will drop the hammer. And then there will be this final verdict. Either death, eternal death, or life, eternal life. And so this morning you need to ask yourself, what will I receive on that day? Is it death or life? And please don't listen to the voice of the evil one who is trying to give you other alternatives. This is a very well-known verse. In fact, I don't need to exegete it, but I must exegete it if I would be faithful. The, the verse itself divides quite neatly, actually, two halves. The wages of sin is death. And so I want to put it this way. Death is the wages of sin. Death. The emphasis is on the word death. It's in capital letters. That's the pay you get. And then eternal life is the gift of God. Again, we saw uh, in uh, last week that this is one of other verses of Paul that begin with uh, with uh, with four. These words as I explained earlier, gives a reason or purpose. And the word translated wages is, could also be translated pay off. Uh, this is the payment given to a soldier for his military service. And again, you re realize that that does tie up with what we saw as the instruments do not present your members as instruments for unrighteousness. That word instrument we saw could be translated weapons. So you can see, here is a military officer. He has weapons, therefore he is a soldier. And the soldier has to be paid. Now, what, what does he get? So this is a reference to the wages earned after service, rendered, or work done. For example, if a worker, if a farmer labors in a shamba for a full day, uh, I mean, a farmer hires someone to work at his shamba for a full day, then he will give the laborer a full day's pay, isn't it? What if he came and gave him half day's pay? Let's say you agreed that for the day I will pay you a thousand shillings. Then at the end of the day you are giving him 500 shillings. Do you, do you think he will readily accept that? No. What if you came at the end of the day and gave him 1,500 shillings? What do you think will happen? He would be very happy. But will the farmer be very happy? No. So there is no equity. There is no justice there. That's not what this verse is talking about. The verse is saying, you agreed it's a thousand, and it shouldn't be more or less for justice on both parties. So, exactly what he has earned, no more, no less, is what that word means. It denotes that full payment at the end of a day's full labor. He should be paid exactly what he deserves. His wages due, given in perfect equity and absolutely fair. And so the word here, wages, is saying, sinners have been working all the days of their lives, what would they get? What is the full pay 
for a full life's service to Sassin. Death. And this, we are not talking about physical death here because everyone will die anyway. We are talking about spiritual death. In fact, it is eternal death that is in view. Now that's a parallel there. It's either eternal death or eternal life. So every sinner has been given, uh, has been working for this pastor called sin. I know you don't think about it this way, but every time you are lying, okay, every time you're being covetous, uh, covetous every time you're being greedy, every time you are committing any sin, whether the sin of heart, or of mind, whether sin of word or of deed, there is, there is your service to this pastor called sin. And when you do that, he smiles because you are doing what he wants you to do. And he will pay you for the wages earned. Fair wages, you know, as sinful as this master called sin is, he is a fair master. He gives wages due to his servants fairly, justly, and equitably. He will give nothing less, nothing more. It is what you deserve. Because what does the law say? What does the law say about sin? The soul who sins shall die. That's a bad news. God will punish all sin. And don't, uh, God gave the verdict when he said to Adam and Eve in the garden, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For once you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then fast forward, eat the fruit, then God comes with death and curse for eating of the forbidden fruit. So, commission and omission contravening God's law, failing to meet the standard of God's law, that is sin. So we, you may sin outwardly, you may sin inwardly, actions, words, thoughts, desires. So whether you've hated or murdered, you have sinned against God. And liable to the judgment and the curse of the law. And this is not, this is not a harsh penalty. It is equitable and just. Because this is exactly what God has told us in his word. Adam and his wife ate of it. Despite a clear command of God, despite the threat of, of death by God. And in eating of it, they plunged all of us, all their offspring into death. Because sin came into the world through one man and so death spread to, uh, and death through sin and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Romans 5.12 Yes, when Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, they did not die physically immediately, but they died spiritually immediately. And they began to die progressively physically and eventually died uh, at age 9.30. Yeah. 
death is that separation between man and God. Death is that separation of two nations that ought to be harmonious. Not anymore. And so this death penalty remained on the books of God. From that time when Adam and Eve sinned. For we read in Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 16. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. Each one shall be put to death for his own sin. And again, the story, the books of God continue to record that verdict. In 2 Kings 14 verse 6, we read, Each one shall die for his own sins. Each one shall die for his own sins. And you come to Ezekiel 18 verse, verse, verse 4, verse 14, verse 20. It all says the same thing. Each one, the soul who sins shall surely die. The soul who sins shall die. So the judge of heaven and earth has declared the penalty due for sin. You will be paid for what you deserve. And it is death. 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 Nothing more, nothing less. So it may be sin of hatred. It may be murder. The sentence is sin. It may be a short lie with just two letters. You just said no when you should have said yes. Maybe you just shook your head. You didn't even utter a word. The wages of that sin is death. So the wages of a lie is death. The wages of being proud is death. And I'm saying that so that you can see this scene, not as some, you know, not some idea out there, but actually the scenes that you commit. Because we tend to, to say, well, the wages of sin is death, but we don't know what that scene is. Put your sin in place of sin and say, the wages of greed is death. And you will see the difference. We tend not to do that. We are happier for it to be some general word, sin. And uh, as as we've gone out to evangelize, especially among to the Rendile people, I realize that when you say sin, it doesn't communicate anything at all to them. Because you see, their understanding of sin is very, very flawed, being not informed by the gospel. So for them, there is, no, there is nothing wrong with... Uh, with uh, I mean, it's so, it's so many... Uh, so many things. If, and this is also true of the Pokots and the Trukanas, if a Pokot killed a Trukana or a Rendile killed a Borana, that's not sin. And there is no cleansing right to deal with that, really. So the understanding of what murder is, is if you killed another one of your own tribesmen. And you come to a scene like lying. Lying to them is not telling him what he shouldn't know. Okay? So don't want him to know what you know. So you do everything you can to cover it. And really there is no clear word to speak of lying. So lying to them is like concealing to your advantage, but then uh, you have to do that to protect yourself. So if someone came to you and said, please give me a cup of milk for my children, 
and, uh, and you know that you have milk, but you don't want to give it away for the sake of your own children. So you say, sorry, I don't have any milk. So to them, that's not lying. You're only caring for your children. What did you expect me to do? They would say. He wanted me to give the milk for my children. I love what happens to mine. And I can go on and on. And you see the flow of sin. So when, we, when you're talking about sin with them, we don't use the word sin at all. We say lying. We talk about sexual immorality. We talk about stealing. We talk about, and again, there is a problem there. Stealing cows from the Karamojang is really not stealing. That, that's the, you, you're just showing yourself to be a warrior and able to bring, you know, to look for property, as they say. And the point I'm making there is, it's very easy for us to talk about sin in an abstract Mana. We don't see the sins that we commit as sinful enough because we don't put it there and say, when I lie, I deserve death. But do we? Actually, for most people, it is if I lied and I wasn't caught. You give yourself a pat in the back and say, well, I'm quite smart. I wasn't caught. But the wages of sin, whatever sin is, is what? I know you don't like it, but that's what the Bible is saying. What? What sin is the Bible talking about? Every sin, any sin, all sin. Okay, so you have, um, you have self-service. Food is set on the table. And you want the best for yourself. And you want the most for yourself. What is that? Gluttony. Right? Do we say the wages of gluttony is death? Yes? Do we say the wages of covetousness is death? Are you getting uncomfortable? I can see people fidgeting. It's the wages of every sin, all sin, any sin that are deserving of death. They deserve that divine judgment, then the divine judgment is death. The soul whose sins shall surely die. You die for your sins. You shall not be excused and you shall not escape. Death awaits every sinner for this is what every sin deserves. God has said, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Can you say, after hearing that list and say, well, pastor, please, it's not me. I'm not on that list. I've never done any of those things. Can anyone here say that? Yes? I mean, the greedy 
are put together with not just drunkards, because, you know, those are people of the same feather, but even revilers, swindlers, thieves. And it's not specified thieves of what? They may be thieves of time, for all I know. Thieves of time. You're employed for eight hours a day with a lunch break and maybe a tea break. I don't know. But whatever it is, are you working to give your boss value for his money or are you stealing his time? God has said, do not be deceived. But also God has said, and such were some of you. It is in the past. But you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. You are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. The Bible is clear that there are people who will be condemned. And so John wrote the revelation of John. As for the cowardly, listen to that. As for the cowardly. And at that point I pause because so many of us are so much afraid of men. You know? You know people are not doing the right thing, but you cannot master the courage to tell them to stop sinning against God. As for the faithless, as for the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. So the Bible says. And again, John says, we know that outside the celestial city are the dogs, the sorcerers, and the sexually immoral, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Are you warned enough? If you live in sin, know for sure. That unless you repent, you will perish. Unless you repent, you will perish. Unless you call upon the name of the Lord while he is near, you will perish. Unless you consider your lies and your pride and cast out them all at the cross of Christ. Unless you get rid of your hatred and malice, you will get eternal death. Unless you get rid of your drunkenness, even though perhaps no one knows, you will be cast with the devil and the demons in the lake of fire and sulfur. Unless you repent of your corruption and your bribery, the Lord will cast you into hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched, as we saw earlier today. Unless you run to Christ today when you've had the message of salvation, you put your soul at great risk. So Hebrews 2.2 2 says, Every transgression and disobedience will receive a just retribution, a just penalty. Every single individual transgression will receive a corresponding punishment. And the punishment is death. And you know, our own judicial system recognizes that. It's an eye for an eye where there is no corruption. So my, my emphasis there is this. You know the kind of sins that you commit privately, secretly? No one knows. But God knows. I mean, you like to think that no one knows, but God knows. And he is saying, the wages of sin is death. 
the wages of all sin, any sin, every sin is death. And every sin that you see equated with death every time. And that will be used of the Lord for your sanctification. Secondly and lastly, eternal life is a gift of God. The free gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ, and Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, this is, this is a sigh of relief, isn't it? This is a breath of fresh air. You know, you hear about sin and it's suffocating because you know what sins you've committed. But then you, you, you come out to this breeze of the gospel and you're told that there is a gift. It is a free gift. It is a gracious gift. It is a gift given by God himself. It is the gift of God. It is a gift of eternal life. And this gift is given in and through Christ Jesus, who is our Lord, who is our Master. Let's consider this. Once again, what does every sin deserve? The wrath and curse of God. But then, God in His grace, that word translated free gift can be translated the gracious gift of God. In fact, if you're, if you're using Microsoft Word and you type free gift, it doesn't like it. It wants you to delete the word free because gift by definition is free. Okay? But if you want the Microsoft Word to accept free gift, right? Gracious gift. It will like that. So this gift is given by God. This is not what you deserve. This is not what you earned. If your life were to be put together, it would not be that you deserve any grace. If your life were to, to be put together and you, you say, his life equals it would be equals death. But then you see, the gospel begins afresh and it writes a new, a new sentence, which is not gift, I mean not wages, but gift. In other words, not what you deserve, but what you've been given. By grace. We are saved. And so, you read in Ephesians chapter, chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, it tells you of what you were. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. But then in verse 4 it says, But God, being, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And then it says, by grace, by grace, there it is again, by grace we've been saved. For by grace, you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. We receive that for which we had not worked for, for that for which we had not earned. We Christians received a gift, and any unbeliever can receive this gift from Christ. We received God's gift of grace, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer. When Christ died at the cross of Golgotha, he was cancelling the record of death that stood against us with its legal demands of death. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. As Paul tells the Colossians in Colossians 2.14, what is this certificate of death that was nailed to the cross? Do you know what it was? I, I have never been to the Kenyan prison cells, but many, the, the, the general practice all over the world would be when they are 
locking in someone, they need to have a, a, a cut at the entrance of his prison door that is written, locked in here is a murderer. And his penalty is a life sentence. So that record spoken of there nailed to the cross is the record that said, you were a sinner, and two, the penalty you deserved is death. But where is it nailed? It's not to your cross. It is nailed where? To the cross of Christ. That's what Paul is talking about there in Colossians 2.14. He nailed it to the cross, to the cross. And it consisted of decrees of God against us because of our myriads of sins, including Adamic sin. All the sins we committed were charged against us. But who bore the charge? The Lord Jesus Christ. In reality, this is what we nailed to the cross when we confess of our sins to Jesus Christ, when we repent of our sins to him. When crucifying a criminal, the Romans would always do that. Nail the charges and the penalty to the cross. And that's what Jesus Christ bore for us. For the Bible says, the law says, Cursed, cursed is the man who is hung on a tree. Where did that curse for us go? To Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus paid it all. When he said it is, it is finished, he was saying it is paid in full. God in his justice cannot charge, the, uh, cannot charge us that for which Jesus Christ paid. God the Father took every sin that you ever committed in your entire life from the beginning until you die and posted it on the certificate of death at the cost of his son, his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the gift of grace. The free gift of God. That is it. Eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We are forgiven. Fully forgiven. It is all paid in full. And not only has the debt been paid, but we've been given a gift of God. The gift of God, Jesus Christ. He has given us life and life abundantly. Eternal life. He has reconciled us to God, having, having brought peace with God and thus communion with God. He now gives us a free gift of eternal life. What does that mean? This means, eternal life means living with, living eternally in harmony with God. Living eternally in harmony or in communion with God. He gives us a free gift of eternal life. This means living eternally with the Father in communion with Him forever. No more hostility, no more condemnation. It's all nailed to the cross and we bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord of my soul. That word translated eternal life carries with it not just the aspect of an ending time. <clears throat> it's not just the aspect of time, which is an ending, which is unceasing. But when it is combined with life, it comes with that quality of existence that is genuine. So the, the focus is on quality, the, the characteristic characteristic of that which is free, without any defect, no blemish, it's genuine, it's authentic, it's without limitation. Eternal life has both the quantity and the quality of life at the very best degree in any possible way. So eternal life is not simply a life that never ends, but that life 
that is lived in communion with God, with no blemish, no spot, with no limitation, no defect. But you must be in Christ to have it. Because the gift of God is eternal life in, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And the question here is, are you in Christ? Are you in Christ? Have you been made a real Christian, washed in our Redeemer's blood? I'm not asking you whether you, you have ever responded to an altar call. I'm not asking you whether you've repeated the preacher's prayer. But that's not what I'm asking. So many people repeat the preacher's prayer, sinners, and they still leave sinners. I'm asking you, have you been to the cross of Christ and have you pled with him to save you? And has he saved you? Has the burden of your sins been rolled away? Have you been made a real Christian, washed in our Redeemer's blood? You see, when you repeat a preacher's prayer and say, Lord Jesus, and you say, Lord Jesus, I am a sinner, I am a sinner, and you parrot and parrot and parrot, you don't understand what sin that, what is the sin you've committed, do you? Do you know that you've broken God's law? You have sinned against God, a holy God? And God is holding you responsible for it. And he's saying the wages of your sin is death. Is this a, is this a way to approach God having sinned against him and, and repeat some preacher's prayer? And say, well, I am saved because I repeated that preacher's prayer. Repentance is, is that you see the awfulness of your sins. You see how, hor how horrible before God your sins are. And you see how you've sinned against a holy God. You know, this morning we were, we were dealing with one of, the, one of the objections that people have to the doctrine of hell as eternal punishment. And they say, well, it can't be eternal. It's just annihilation because uh, how, how can you sin for a minute, just lie for a minute, and then you're, you're punished for all eternity in hell? Someone objects like that. They say that the punishment in hell is, is disup it's not dis it is not in proportion to your sinning. And we were, we were saying, this man, does he understand does he understand the evil of sin? Do you know what degree any sin affects God as you break his law and as you and it affects his, his creation? We don't. And I pointed out that the way to know the weight and the extent of any sin is to mark the sacrifice for sin appointed. And to mark who bears the load of sin. It is Jesus Christ, God man. And so to come and just repeat, you know, the preacher's words casually and say, yeah, I repeated, I repeated the, I repeated the prayer. Yeah, I even told God to delete his, my name on the book of death and and he wrote it in the book of life. How do you know? This is all presumption. It's actually very silly. How do you think that God can be commanded or instructed by a dead sinner to delete his name from the book of death and to write it in the book of life? Who, who are you? And, and preachers do this and they deceive Many, many people with this altar call stuff. Really, altar call nonsense. 
If someone has been truly conv uh, convicted by the Holy Spirit of his sins, he himself, she herself, will go kneel before God and in humble contrition confess all his sins and say, Lord, I've lived a lie. I've been such a hypocrite. I've been going to church, you know, wanting everyone to think that I'm a Christian. I haven't been a Christian. I've just been li living in hypocrisy. My sins have been sweeping under the carpet. How so many people do that? So then I ask you, are you going to one's death? Eternal death? Or are you going to eternal life? Because these are the only two verdicts. No other alternative. It's one or the other is your portion. It's either eternal death or eternal life. There is no alternative. You'll neither be able to say, neither. You know, the atheists say, well, there's no hell, there's no life. None. None of the above is their answer. <laughs> the Bible says we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Think about, th think about that guy. What's the name of the atheist uh, chairman, president? Think about Harrison standing before the judgment seat of Christ and then he, he says, I don't want to go to hell. I don't want to go to heaven because they do not exist. That would be very convincing, isn't it? Now, you can also, you can also not say all of the above. No. No. You cannot even say, let me think about it. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Here is a call to repent of your sins. Come every sinner by sin oppressed. There is mercy in the Lord. He does not turn away a murderer. He does not turn away a prostitute. He does not turn away anyone. If he turned away a mandra, David and Saul of Tarsus would not be in heaven today. If he turned away a prostitute who repents, then Rahab, that prostitute of Jericho, and the Samaritan woman would not be in heaven today, but they are. The Lord in his mercy saved them. And the Bible says as much. Even that woman caught in adultery in John 8 was, forg was forgiven. He will save a repenting thief as he did on the cross. He will save a liar who comes to him by faith in his son. He will save you. He will save you now. Amen. And then I took a, I, I talk to you who is doubting. Are you certain that you are saved from your sins by Jesus Christ? Have you come all the way to Christ? Come all the way like Judas, son of Iscariot, and, and sat on the same table with him? And preferred to live in hypocrisy or in doubt. Now I'm not asking you whether you come to church or whether you sing or whether you pray or whether you tithe. I'm not asking you that. Yes, you go to church. Yes, we can see you're a religious man, a religious woman. But has your soul been saved and you know it? Are you certain? I'm asking you whether you know for sure. That you are a child of God. Going to heaven. Destined to heaven. To eternal life. Because God does not ask whether you are a religious man. 
He had so many Pharisees and he had no respect for them with all their religions. You see, if you don't remember repenting of your sins specifically, and you don't remember the joy of relief when the burden of your sins was rolled away, if you do not know peace with God, come to Christ also, believe in Him with absolute certainty that He's able to save to the uttermost all those who draw near to him by faith. And then finally, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Amen. Some of you, you've battled sin one after another, one temptation after another. You know you've believed in Christ, you know whom you've believed. But the snares of the world, the attractions of the world, the patterns of the world sometimes bring you down and you stumble. But the Bible says a righteous man may fall up to seven times, but he will rise up. You've been oppressed by sin. You have fought with sin. I know that you've not fought to the point of shedding your blood, but you've been fighting with sin. You will finally triumph because Jesus Christ triumphed for you. And you've been made more than a conqueror. You've been made a heir of grace. You've been set on the path of eternal life in the presence of God forever. This is a reason to live for his glory, to live for his service. What a blissful and joyous life await those who have hated this world and loved the Savior. They have eternal life. They have life abundant. They, there is no greater joy than to know that not only has the noose of death been removed, but you have been given the best of life to live. Amen.